doing this today because not only is there a lot going on in the world, which I'm going to discuss, but uh, also to let everybody know that uh, as I've done some filler videos, you know, as I've come back very uh, for a very limited amount of time, as I promised I might do uh, to finish my project, I decided to do some filler videos in between the time my project is finished and airs and uh, basically when I did my farewell and said I might come back. So these are just some of the filler videos that I've been doing recently, including the three that are up at the live stream and the two newest videos. So I'll be doing this one as well because there's some things I wanted to touch on that uh, have been going on as the situation is developing around the world, uh, the Midi and also in uh, Europe. So I guess I'm going to start by saying that my... Uh, unfinished project that I said I'd come back to finish briefly is uh, nearing completion, you know, it'll probably air in a few weeks, at least the beginning parts of it, you know, because there's a lot of battles that have to be done. That's going to be a fairly lengthy project, you know, but I'll at least be able to air like perhaps the first half of it, which is good because it means I'm on good track to uh, go ahead and knock that out and get that done. So, anyways, about the situation going on around the world, um, I want to remind everybody that we live in a time where narratives and propaganda and psyops are going to be all the way out of control. I mean, there's going to be so much dis and misinformation because it's a time of war and because this regime supports certain sides in that war. Um, all the narratives are going to be geared towards either belittling or demonizing the regime's perceived enemies or uh, basically hiding uh, losses and minimizing casualties on our side. I'm just going to go ahead and uh, make that statement because it's a fact. You know, that's what happens in times of war. Uh, things get covered up or swept under the rug, at least until they can't be. I mean, we've already seen examples of this going on with Ukraine. I mean, <clears throat> you, you've seen that it's gotten so bad to the point to where now even the Ukrainians have to admit to such horrendous losses that they've sustained that uh, they can no longer hide it. I mean, the graveyards are full. They're uh, exhuming bodies from other graveyards just so they can turn them into mass graves just to bury their dead. The graves don't lie. I mean, they've lost hundreds of thousands of dead and many hundreds of thousands wounded. <clears throat> and Russia, due to having complete artillery and missile and air dominance in this conflict and drones as well, has suffered much less casualties. The casualty rate is something like 1 to 20 favoring the Russian side. So <clears throat> you have a situation where you have approximately 25,000 Russian dead and anywhere between 400 and 500,000 Ukrainian dead. You know, that's 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 the realistic casualty figures. And the reasons for that, again, is Russian artillery dominance. You have, a, you have an army that has been sitting back on the defensive, basically in extremely well fortified lines, you know, absorbing attack after attack and just blanketing the enemy with salvos of howitzer and rocket artillery and thermo barracks and airstrikes and missile strikes and kamikaze drone strikes. Uh, so the Russians have, of course, sustained far less casualties, and the Pentagon tends to go with uh, whatever Ukraine puts out, and Ukraine, being the corrupt regime that it's under, is going to put out some re really kooky, nutty, crazy figures, you know, like they're going to massively over-exaggerate the Russian dead, and they're going to massively under-report their own dead and wounded, so... Um, the Pentagon tends to go with whatever they put out, and that's how the media gets their figures. They get it from the Pentagon, who gets it from, you know, Zelensky, who lies about everything. So, you know, that's part of the type of propaganda I'm talking about. And you're going to see us do the same thing in the Mideast when we start suffering casualties and losing aircraft and ships. You know, 
they might not be able to hide the ships that are lost because that's too big of a loss, but you know, they're gonna try and do it with aircraft and personnel on the ground. Um, with the most recent attacks on some of our installations in the Middle East, like in Iraq and, and Syria, uh, I would guess, you know, in my honest opinion, I truly believe that uh, some of those figures are massively underreported. I think that we most likely have had some KIAs and WIAs that they're uh, not reporting or, or under-reporting and making it seem like it's not as bad as it actually is. Um, and that's going to be a common thing in a conflict. You know, you're, you're going to have propaganda in a time of war. I mean, you've already gotten a taste of it watching all the propaganda with the Russo-Ukraine conflict so far. I mean, you've already seen some of the narratives, even the ones I've taken apart on my channel, like, and shown you how they were narratives and uh, used real facts and figures to prove it. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit of that again because there was a narrative I heard uh, about, you know, Russia getting some stuff from North Korea. Again, the same narrative that was ba basically reported that I tore apart in my community tab. Uh, it's still up, as, actually, if people want to look at it. But uh, they tried to use the same narrative again recently. And actually, what they did was they took. See, here's the truth of it. North Korea, of its own volition, voluntarily, Russia didn't ask, North Korea asked to send forces because North Korea uh, doesn't want their military to atrophy in terms of performance. They need combat experience. So they volunteered to send uh, two to three corps, about like 60 to 100,000 men, to uh, the Russo Ukraine war to gain combat experience. And Russia didn't decline them. Russia said, sure, if you want to, practically. So Basically, North Korea loaded up their units on trains with all their equipment and sent it into Russia. And the media took that and spun it and pretended like, you know, Russia asked North Korea for hardware. Massively less industrialized North Korea, uh, Russia asked them for stuff. When Russia outproduces the entire Western world by a factor of seven to one in artillery production, artillery shell production, seven to one, the entire collective West against Russia, seven to one. You know, that's Russia outproducing producing the West and howitzer artillery from by a factor of seven to one in artillery shells. So uh, Russia already outproduces the collective West, entire collective West combined by a factor of two to one when you average out everything. I'm talking about not just ammunition types, but, you know, missiles and vehicles and uh, artillery pieces, all that stuff. If you average everything out, you know, combined, Russia outproduces the West by a factor of two to one of everything combined, you know, like averaged out, uh, like all vehicle types, ammunition types types but in just in howitzer shells it's seven to one russia to the west so russia who produces all these shells and has enormous stockpiles from the soviet era of uh rocket and howitzer shells rocket artillery and howitzer shells uh the soviet union produced roughly a billion of these so russia has these ginormous stockpiles of ammunition just like china during the cold war did and you know both china and russia have these enormous stockpiles and yet you know russia had to ask north korea for shells when russia's already expended 10 million shells already i remember before i did my uh, farewell streams when I didn't intend to come back unless I was coming back to do my project like I said I might which I'm going to do I decided so you know before I stopped you know YouTube you know five months ago I I had reported last that it was about six million shells you know I tried to keep people updated on how much the Russians expended in terms of their artillery expenditures and you know now it's up to 10 million so uh, and that's really not putting that much of a dent in their entire shell supply of 122 millimeter, 130 millimeter, 152 millimeter, and 203 millimeter howitzer artillery shells. So it's really not putting that much of a dent into it. And they're still producing shells at an enormous rate. So although it's not as much as they expend, it's still replacing a lot of the ones that they've expended. So it's really not like that massive, uh, you know, huge big of a deal. So, you know, North Korea wanting to send you know some of their units to fight alongside of you know the russians to gain some combat experience got spun as russia getting you know uh getting you know weaponry and shells and weapons you know uh, of whatever from north korea they didn't I, i've seen a few articles about it they didn't really expound on it or elaborate but it was kind of funny to me because i already knew the truth of it so 
I've took that same exact narrative apart before, almost two years ago. So, yeah, it's pretty ridiculous. But you're going to see all kinds of propaganda like that. Now, with the Ukraine thing winding down, Ukraine is literally throwing everything they have at Russia. It's like they're in their final death throes, you know. I mean... I saw a Colonel McGregor video not that long ago, and he was talking about how, you know, Ukraine is down to using child soldiers. And, of course, they're old men that they've been using for quite some time, you know, that I've already reported on months ago. You know, they're still using their geriatric brigades, but now they're using, you know, young boys, too, which is a war crime to use child soldiers. That is a that is illegal. That is an international war crime. You know, that's a heinous ass war crime, too. The Russians are capturing 14, 15, 16 year old boys and you know taking them POW and you know that that's just that's just pathetic and it's insane it's insanity that land is demographically destroyed from all the people that have fled all the millions that have fled and said they'd never return and all the people that are left being mauled to death by the Russian armed forces and one example of a crazy narrative is how the Ukrainians tried to say that they had killed uh, 200,000 Russians when for the longest time for most of this entire campaign campaign, this uh, uh, limited incursion, what the Russians call a special military operation in quotes, you know, I mean, for most of that, there were only 70 combat battalions in country, meaning, you know, 63 to 65,000 troops, Russian battalion sizes. How in the hell could Ukraine kill 200,000, 200,000 of them when there was only like 63 to 65,000 in there for most of the campaign before Russia started its enormous buildup of hundreds of thousands in a crescent shape around Ukraine from Belarus all the way to Russia swooshing down into uh, southeastern Ukraine, which is the captured land that they took near Mariupol and uh, Crimea, you know. How in the hell did Ukraine kill 200,000 200, odd Russians when they only had 63 to 65,000 there most of the campaign before they started their massive buildup? That's insane. That is, that's some of the craziness I'm talking about. That's some of the lunacy and insanity I'm talking about with, the, with these narratives, you know. And you're going to see a lot of it now with this Middle East conflict as well. I'm just warning people. You know, you can't take everything you hear at face value. Whatever gets reported, you cannot take it at face value. You've got to validate it on your own or, you know, assume that there's something wrong with the information. You know, that's what I do. I'm very, you know, skeptical and cynical anymore when I look at things, you know. I always wonder as far as, you know, my cynicism, you know, like who, you know, who benefits and, you know, what is this, you know, what's the purpose of this? And, you know, you know, is where, what, what's behind it? You know, like, is it financial or is it like an agenda? You know, I mean, I look at everything like that now. I, I don't, I don't take anything at face value. I research everything and validate it, you know, with my own sources and uh, time spent on research. I'm an avid researcher, as you all know. I mean, it's, you know, it's what I live for it's like my hobby you know i mean i've spent most of my life on this subject matter as far as like the international military domain you know i had my army career uh, i've been in a, a conflict you know I was injured in a conflict, you know, I, I, I've dodged a lot of close calls in the conflict, and I've meted out some brutality in a conflict, and yeah, I, I've learned a lot, you know, I've had a lot of life experiences, and you know, I've, I, I pride myself on uh, education, I don't mean pride as in like being prideful, I'm just using it as a figure of speech, you know, I, I, I'm not a prideful person, I'm actually, if you knew me, you would see I'm quite humble, you know, I mean, but I'm just saying that this subject matter, this is what I excel in. This is what I care about. This is what I take a keen interest in. And I can tell everybody that, you know, the, the insanity that's going on in this world right now. I mean, we are so outmatched that, you know, we are well on our way to destruction as far as like Western civilization, the Western world. It is on its way out and its leaders are on their way out. Just as Deuteronomy 28 basically states, is that the king and the people will go into bondage. The king equals the ruling class, not just the literal head of state, the literal ruler, the literal king or, you know, leader, whatever. It, it means the entire ruling class and people will go into bondage by those who engage in the conquest. So 
What I'm saying is that the Western elites, there's a battle of two systems, the Eastern and Western system. The Western system is a bankster ran system that controls its politicians as puppets of the regimes that the banks control. In the West and in the East, you have the Eastern elites who sit in the positions of power within the regimes themselves because they, they control their central banks. It's not the other way around like in the West. That's why there's two different systems, and that's why each is competing for power, and there can only be one, because the true NWO is the ten Eastern kings, the BRICS plus kings of Revelation. It's not going to be a Western New World Order. These Western elites that do all these rituals and, you know, they think that they run things, no. They're going to be judged first, you know, even before the ten kings are destroyed at Armageddon. These Western elites... Yes, they did help to build the NWO, just not their NWO. They helped to build the Eastern NWO by ripping their own power block apart and basically throwing it to the wolves. These Western elites have done everything to self-destruct their own power base, the, the West. You know, their entire base of their power, where they got all their power, their, their control, their everything, their riches, their finances, all of it, their 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 hard and soft power, they destroyed it all, while the East built itself up and surpassed the West. So all these confrontations is the West basically as a dying entity trying to, you know, gamble its last bit of resources on some kind of a victory so it can basically, you know, try to obtain a standing in the world uh, by, you know, achieving one last victory somewhere, anywhere. That's what all this is about. It's the clash of two systems, a clash of two different sets of elites seeking world domination. That's why there will be a third world war. You cannot have a one world order without the third world war. It has to be something so catastrophic and destructive and life ending that people will be willing to give up everything to stop having wars and for there to be peace. And there has to be one final brutal nihilistic destructive war that ends enormous amounts of life and folks these regional wars are not world war three don't get it twisted let me tell you something you know world war ii saw well over 50 million dead we haven't seen anything like that in these regional wars as bad as they are and they're bad they're brutal they're ugly they're nasty they're vicious as nasty and brutal as they are we haven't seen nothing yet these regional wars combined so far don't even add up to really a percent of what World War II was. I mean, I mean, yeah, maybe like 1% of it. But, I mean, I'm saying that, you know, it is going to get massively worse. But the main place where it's going to get immensely worse isn't going to be overseas. It's going to be right here in the Western Hemisphere. It's going to be right here in North America when China and Russia brutally smash this place into dust, and they will. China, as much as I've hated it, you know, I, I had to grow to accept it, and I, and I do, but I used to hate the fact that China has surpassed us in, in terms of its overall power. I go by real facts, figures, stats, capabilities, national assets and attributes, data, all of that, numbers um, and more. I go by that. I don't go by what nominal things are, what people say. People can claim anything nominally, but it doesn't make it so. It doesn't make it true. What do I mean by that? Well, people who can say, well, America is the most powerful nation in the world. No, it's not. How is America more powerful than China when America, you know, only has like one eighth the amount of industry China has when America has a smaller military than China, a smaller total armed forces? Because China, if you add all their paramilitary and active military together, we don't hold a candle to the ginormous beast that is China. You know, China has more advanced technology than we do. You know, they, they absolutely do. And, you know, China has more gold than we do, even in their own private citizens' hands. Even their citizens have been buying gold. And, and you know, 
because they have this enormous middle class now in China and they can afford to do things like that. China has grown in economic power and, you know, they're, they're, they have eclipsed us in economic power in real terms. You know, most of our GDP comes from credit and welfare and, you know, Ponzi schemes and paper playing and, you know, the stock market, you know, games and everything. It's not real. It's fake. It's artificial. There are uh, and most of our GDP is gone. You know, it's been shrinking since 2020. We already lost a third of it when they did the shutdowns and killed small business. That used to be the backbone of our economy and they destroyed much of it. You know, and then it shrunk even more, you know, by 2022. It, we, it's it's basically half of what it of what it claims to be. It's like half of what it originally was. You know, it, it was supposed to be 24 trillion and now it's down to around 12 trillion. It's in that ballpark. So I'm saying in real terms, you know, even a AI.org is one that sticks out in my mind. I don't have all the papers in front of me. You know, I have a lot of stuff wrote down on all kinds of papers. I'm very disorganized like that, but I, that's, you know, I write down sources. I write down information on all kinds of paper, but in my mind that sticks out to me because that they come out and just say it, you know, they just come out and blatantly say it, you know, America's GDP is shrunk by half, you know, it's, and, and that just goes to show you that when you have an economy that's built on funny money and paper schemes and welfare and credit, and, and just nonsense, you know, digits, you know, you really don't have anything. But when you have a solid foundation, you know, an economy built on heavy industries, light industries, you know, based on, you know, an enormous military industry, uh, technology and uh, in, in massive technological sector, um, you have basically an e enormous service economy. I mean, they have small business. I mean, they have it all. I mean, China's enormous. You know, sure, every country has its, you know, issues. And yes, China does have, you know, a, a section of its population in poverty, but so do we. So do we. We have half our country on welfare. You know, I mean, it's... It's really like the pretty much China for a country of their size and population for them to only have 200 million uh, in the poverty level when they have a population of 1.5 billion. That's pretty damn incredible. You know, and we have half our population on welfare, you know, roughly 150 million. You know, that that's, you know, China has basically close, maybe, you know, a little more, but they, they have about the same amount of people in poverty. But as a percentage of their whole population, they sure don't have half their people on welfare. They only have, you know, like they, they only have a small percent of their people in the poverty level, poverty line. You know, they the rest of their population is mostly middle class. Class and they have more billionaires than we do now. So China is basically a very, very wealthy nation and their regime has an enormous defense budget. And that's why their military has has grown to eclipse ours. And their purchasing power parity is incredible because they can get a lot more for their money in China than we can get for our dollar inside America. That's the purchasing power parity. Um, so we have this enormous defense budget and very little to show for it. Uh, you know, the F-35 that I always talk about, you know, the Government Accountability Office just came out and said that they're only operational 55% of the time because 45% of the time they're grounded due to maintenance issues. So there you go. There's yet another source proving what I say to be correct about the F-35 being garbage. You know, I mean, there's a lot of other reasons behind it, too. It's, I mean, the Chinese have hacked them. And, you know, Chinese electronic warfare assets on Mumian, Mumian Island, on their base on Mumian Island in the South Pacific, almost made two of them crash. It strayed within range of it, you know, the outer ranges of it you know they had to you know turn around quickly and get out of get out of that area because they were being electromagnetically you know messed with to the point to where they almost lost control of their aircraft and crashed into the sea i mean you know our forces are highly vulnerable speaking of china they made a statement yesterday you know, I guess it would be yesterday at the time I made this video, uh, and by the time it uploads, which would be probably later today, um, you know, they they made a statement that they will guarantee Iran's sovereignty, as in, you know, they're not going to allow anybody to overthrow Iran, to overthrow their regime. China said that. 
as per bilateral agreements made with China and Russia separately, you know, both China and Russia have troops inside Iran. That's a fact. That was done two years ago. It was even reported on by a lot of people besides even me. Uh, China has 50,000 troops in Iran right now. You know, so they can they can back up their words. You know, they also have naval bases in the area, in the Indian Ocean and, you know, in Djibouti and the Red Sea, you know, at the mouth of the Indian Ocean. So China had their task force sailing through on a routine visit. You know, it was a six vessel task force, but they sure had a lot of firepower in that small task force, you know, like that type of uh ship they had, the Type 052D, which is China's answer to the American Aegis class vessels. You know, it's it, it, they have a system called the Dragon Eye, which is like China's version of Aegis, which they have 64 missile cells and can carry air defense missiles, anti-ship slash ground attack cruise missiles, and anti-submarine missiles. They have a 130 millimeter cannon and they have a type 1130 close in weapon system, which is like a high speed Gatling gun. And of course they have uh, electronic countermeasure systems and decoys that they can tow behind the ship. They have and they also have an anti-submarine warfare helicopter uh, that can land on the back of the deck on the ship. And they have, of course, their joint service integrated data link system, which uh, links them in with their ISR, their their satellites, their spy planes, drones, uh, ground units, air units, uh, other naval units. It's their inter-service data link system. <laughs> it's like their combat data link system where they can communicate with all kinds of other uh, branches and units and, uh, and their ISR capabilities. So China has had enormous firepower within that small task force because just one of those type 052 d's can carry 64 different missiles they can engage multiple targets at one time just like our Aegis class can they have the hq there i'm sorry the hhq9 which is their air defense artillery missiles which have very high altitude and very long range uh they have the yj18 anti-ship slash uh, ground attack cruise missile they can attack ship or land-based targets with it uh, which has an incredible range of 355 miles they have the cy5 anti-submarine missile which is attacks submarines <laughs> it's a missile that goes after submarines goes down in the water and you know that 130 millimeter cannon is basically like a small artillery cannon for most for the most part i mean because there's towed artillery pieces that are 130 millimeter and that ship based 130 millimeter cannons like having an artillery piece on a ship so they can attack you know multiple targets simultaneously with just one of those ships they carry up to 64 missiles they can attack la land air and sea targets simultaneously so that's one hell of a ship and then they have their type 055 which is a stealth destroyer yeah and that thing's even more advanced but that wasn't part of the uh six ship uh task force but the type 52d was um so china having powerful naval capabilities in the area as well as russia having theirs in syria russia has 15 combat ships as well as auxiliary ships along with that at their uh syrian naval base and they have an air base there too as well in syria so russia has air and naval power in syria uh russia has air power in iran and china has ground power in iran and naval power in the region. So when China says that they're willing to guarantee Iran's sovereignty and they say it as an authoritative statement like back off America, um, that sends a clear message that, you know, not only do we not have the capability to invade a country of Iran's size, population and military power, but, um, you know, it, 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 it's also sending a hell of a message that the most powerful nation on earth, China, is talking down to us like, you know, we're nothing and, you know, we better not mess with Iran, like how we talked to Saddam Hussein about Kuwait, you know, I mean, they're talking to us like we're uh, Iraq in 1990 and 91, you know, 
I mean, so China has the power to whoop our ass, you know, single handedly. You know, they don't even need help. But, you know, China backing Iran is is a huge deal. And same with Russia and the region, because Russia and China and Iran guaranteed that Assad was not overthrown in his civil war. He was very close to it. These different factions almost overthrew him. But because Assad's regime had very powerful allies outside of Syria that came to his aid, his regime was saved. Now, I'm going to make a link with this to what's coming in the future a little later in this video, but uh, about the Syrian civil conflict, we armed some of those factions that were against Assad's regime, and we failed in our objective to overthrow Assad. You know, we knocked off Gaddafi's Libya, we knocked off uh, Egypt and put in uh, uh, Mohammed Morsi, but then, you know, he was overthrown by a military coup, and so that was reversed. Uh, you know, but Libya turned into a war zone, a civil war, and Russia supported one of the sides in that, and uh, I believe Turkey supported another and, and that became a mess uh so we left libya as a total disaster you know syria turned into a civil conflict multi-way and that was a disaster i mean we basically ruined a lot of the Mideast, and a lot of these Mideast nations are pre pretty livid at us for it. And uh, Iran basically is saying that they're tired of us, and they said that this is their backyard and that they're not going to allow us to push them around, more or less. That's basically what they've uh, said in layman's terms. So China's saying that they're not going to tolerate or allow anyone to overthrow the Iranian regime sends a strong message too, especially with China's naval forces in the region and their uh, basically army forces inside of uh, Iran itself to protect it. Um, I'm sure they're there with their very capable radars and electronic warfare assets as well. You know, I, I would be very surprised if they weren't. Same with the Russians. You know, I'm sure they brought in some, you know, very potent capabilities of their own into Iran, just like they do in Syria. Um, so... That goes back to what I showed yesterday. The Middle East is essentially a big giant death trap. You know, it is a death trap geographically and politically. As far as politically, I mean the different powers in one region. You know, you have very powerful countries collected together. I mean, you know, like these are like tier two powers. You know, like you have Egypt, you have Israel, you have uh, Turkey, you have uh, Iran, you have Syria, you know, you have Saudi. I mean, these these countries are all like tier two powers as far as like military power. I mean, all of them combined in one subcontinent, one region. I mean, with the exception of Egypt being North Africa, but still it's like connected to Southwest Asia. I mean, so I count them in. But, you know, all of them in that same region is, is a powder keg waiting to erupt. And you have China and Russia there backing their allies, you know, backing Iran primarily, but also Syria, because they've already shown historically that they would prop up Assad no matter what, because they saved his ass in his civil war. Assad was almost out of there. I mean, his ass was almost out of there. I mean, he was so close to being overthrown by the different factions that, you know, it, it seriously took Russia coming in there with their powerful air assets, naval strikes with missiles, and uh, even their ground-based forces in the form of... Uh, Wagner uh, paramilitary because Wagner is essentially you know they answer to the Russian Ministry of Defense they're only a PMC in name they're more like the Russian Foreign Legion you know they have a Russian ex-military but they also have foreigners that uh, enlist too sort of like the French Foreign Legion does uh, they're Russia's answer to the French Foreign Legion but they, they went in there on the ground uh, supported by Russian air power and naval strikes and uh, you had Iran send in their paramilitary forces the IRGC also called the Paz Iran and of course of course, the Quds Force, which is part of that, the Quds Force, I'm sorry. And you had Hezbollah, too, which is also funded and uh, equipped by Iran. And even Syria literally gave uh, Hezbollah entire uh, depots full of arms just to keep them out of rebel hands during the civil conflict. Literally, like Assad did that, he, he actually gave entire arms depots full of weapons to Hezbollah. So Syria had supported them for a while and funded them and trained them as well. But, you know, in the Syrian civil conflict, 
you know, it was, I guess it turned out to be a good investment because Hezbollah helped to save Assad, you know, so the roles got reversed where Hezbollah came in to save the regime that helped to fund him earlier, you know, because the factions got that powerful and that dangerous. Um, but they stabilized the situation. They saved Assad. Assad started rebuilding his military. And surprisingly, Assad has a lot of armor capabilities. I mean, he has a large tank fleet, uh, even compared to Iran, who has a pretty sizable tank fleet. Uh, Syria actually has more tanks, you know, I mean, you know, whether they're, you know, operational or not, you know, because the Syrian army sort of uh, hemorrhaged, you know, it was Assad had to rebuild it, you know, I mean, they still have a military. I mean, it's not as strong as it was before the civil conflict, but he's rebuilding it. Um, but they have a lot of armor. I mean, a little more than even Iran. So, uh, Syria has some strong ground forces. Now, their air defense is a little bit older, but uh, even if, like, you know, the uh, satellites, drones, spy planes, and uh, radars from Russia and China, the ISR stuff, if they lent that to Syria, it would probably improve those air defenses quite a bit, or if Iran gave Syria some of their uh, very strong air defense equipment, or even if Russia did, or China, you know, they could bolster Assad's air defense forces and, you know, bring them back up to a better state of readiness because they've been, you know, basically hemorrhaged during the civil conflict. You know, they were basically, you know, hurt pretty bad. You know, there was recently a shoot down of an Israeli uh, F-16. Um, I think that was a few years back. But uh, yeah, I mean, other than that, the Syrian air defenses have been pretty weakened and they need to be rebuilt. But um, there's no telling what's going on right now. You know, while we're getting forces in the position, there's no telling what Iran, Russia and China are up to. You know, they could be bolstering uh, Syrian air defenses now or, you know, they could just be setting up their own stuff to basically jump in if they have to, if they felt they needed to, you know, like especially in the case of Iran, because China, you know, authoritatively said they will absolutely not allow Iran's sovereignty to be violated, uh, meaning they won't allow the Iranian regime to be overthrown or decapitated or whatever, uh, because they will get involved and they have their forces there to do it. Um, so... You know, same with Syria, but <clears throat> Assad, you know, I, I was thinking a lot about the uh, whole issue with Damascus. And I've said it before in my recent video, this could, this might or might not be when Damascus gets destroyed, you know. I mean, it's very likely that it could. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm not saying that it won't or will, but I'm saying it's likely that it could, you know, because the Levant is going to be full of craters pretty soon. The Levant, you know, meaning the part of the Middle East that encompasses Syria, Lebanon, Israel, and, and Jordan. The Levant is going to be basically a war zone. It's going to be full of craters. It's going to be obliterated. I mean, because both sides are going to be throwing a lot at each other. You know, I mean, and this time we are going to suffer heavy casualties. You know, we will lose pilots. We will lose fighter aircraft. We will lose ships. Yes, ships. You know, Maybe not as much in the Mediterranean, but we will lose uh, ships there. And we absolutely will lose a lot of ships in the Indian Ocean. That would be where we would lose the vast majority of our ships if they tried to go against Iran. Uh, we will lose bases to either a combination of asymmetrical forces like militants or and, and proxies or directly to conventional forces like, say, if Assad Syria got pulled into it and Assad send it, sent his military to take back his own territory that has American forces on it in the far east of Syria. You know, he might do that, you know, and he would succeed because <clears throat> our forces Forces there are very light compared to what he can throw at them. <clears throat> I'm talking about heavy armor, like, you know, armored brigades and whatnot. You know, he can throw that at that enclave of forces we have there, or he could just use militants or, you know, Iran could do it. You know, I mean, it all depends what happens, you know, what how they choose to go about it, you know. Um, Hezbollah has anti-ship missiles, you know, they, they could definitely take out some of our ships, you know, it would all depend on how fast they did it, if they got a first strike, if it was a surprise on their end, or if we struck them first, or uh, however many they were able to get off, and how many we could intercept, if any, and, you know, it would, it would also depend on how well Iran and Syria had fortified Lebanon, you know, assisted, because remember, <clears throat> the Hez guys have been building up their 
uh, bases in southern Lebanon for a very long time, many, many years. And their defenses were so good in 2006. And I followed that war very closely. Israel got bogged down and they basically lost. They were forced to withdraw because they had lost. They'd been defeated. Um, <clears throat> and they don't like to admit that, but that's what happened. You know, they were defeated. They, they uh, Hezbollah stood up to Israel and they won uh, because their defenses were that good. Israel got bogged down and they were unable to maintain a an offensive in that area and they could not achieve their objectives. So, uh, and that was when Hezbollah was smaller. They're much bigger now and they've been fortifying Southern Lebanon for years. So <clears throat> if they send in that Marine expeditionary unit, to try to like outflank them and land on the coast of Lebanon, that will end in disaster. Because again, southern Lebanon is extremely well fortified. Now, I don't know if the Lebanese army would jump in, but I'm sure if Lebanon felt they were uh, their sovereignty was threatened, they would jump in because you have to understand one thing. Lebanon has a lot of Christians in it, and the Lebanese Christians actually support Hezbollah because they see Hezbollah as somebody they can do business with opposed to the Sunnis that live in Lebanon uh, because they see them as more extreme. You know, you have to remember in the Lebanese civil war, there were Christian uh, militias fighting uh, the different Muslim groups. And then you had different Muslim groups fighting each other. You know, you had Sunni forces fighting Shia forces. You had Sunni forces fighting Christian forces like the Southern Lebanese army. You had uh, the Southern Le Lebanese army fighting Hezbollah, but then eventually they all stopped fighting and they decided to get along and share power in the Lebanese regime. So the Southern Lebanese army mostly, you know, became a political party and put down their arms and, you know, the ones that, uh, you know, kept their weapons just joined the Lebanese armed forces and Hezbollah and the Lebanese army have a relationship essentially where they don't attack each other. They just leave each other be. And because Lebanon is still sort of like the Wild West in that sort of way, but there's a tenuous peace there. I mean, they, they've, they've made peace and they share power and they manage to get along there. And some of the Christians there actually really like Hezbollah because they see them as less extreme and they don't have to fight them because they can get along with them, which is, you know, I mean, it sounds crazy, but it's, but it's the truth. So, you know, if the Lebanese army were to get involved, you know, then they would be on the side of Hezbollah, of course, because they would be fighting to defend Lebanon from intruders, invaders, you know, but that would be more of a defensive thing. You know, I don't see them getting involved unless it involves like a defensive type of thing where they feel that they, their nation's, you know, sovereignty is at risk and they have to defend their nation. Um, <clears throat> then they would jump in the side of Hezbollah. But, uh, you know, for now, the, the Lebanese army is just neutral. You know, they're, uh, Hezbollah is actually strong stronger than the Lebanese army anyway, but I mean, I'm just saying that they would be a factor, I'm sure, if Lebanon's sovereignty was threatened. And Syria is a wild card, you know, but Russia is there to guarantee Assad's regime survives. Um, you know, Iran has forces there still. Uh, Hezbollah still has forces there. Um, Assad's army is mopping up pockets of resistance. I mean, he basically, for all intents and purposes, won his civil war. I mean, he, you know, there's just little pockets like a fighting left, and it's very, you know, small scale type of type of resistance in Idlib and, you know, the Kurds and up in their corner. Uh, and, you know, of course, there's the Americans, you know, uh, holding onto their little piece of turf in eastern Syria where the oil and gas regions are. <clears throat> so you have American forces getting attacked by militants already. I mean, you already have some casualty reports. Like I said, I don't believe them. I really don't believe what they say. I think we've already lost some people, whether the, you know, they're ever going to disclose that or not. I don't know, but I'm pretty sure at some point, if they keep trying to hide things that somebody's going to come on the internet, somebody's family is going to come on the internet and they're going to explain that they lost a son or daughter. And, uh, you know, you're going to find out about it that way because, you know, I think quietly they're going to want to cover up any kind of casualties that happen in between now and when the main hostilities begin in this conflict in the Middle East. But, you know, for the fact that our installations are already being attacked already goes to show you that 
the asymmetrical capabilities of Iran blended with their conventional capabilities and their huge missile forces is an enormous threat. You know, from their hit and run naval tactics and their a Navy's ability to launch, you know, medium and long range, you know, anti ship cruise missiles and their land based anti ship cruise missiles and anti aircraft missiles and their Navy's capability to have their, their larger vessels, you know, back up their hit and run vessels, you know, like uh, where they use the larger vessels to, uh, you know, blockade while the smaller vessels go out and do hit and run attacks and come back, you know. I mean, they have a lot of capabilities to uh, use their naval forces asymmetrically from the IRGC Navy to their uh, regular Navy working hand in hand together. Um, their Air Force would be more of like an air defense type force and, uh, you know, a support for the ground forces since they do have ground attack forces, uh, ground attack aircraft, I'm sorry. Uh, like the IRGC Aerospace Forces with their 50 ground attack aircraft that would go hand-in-hand uh, -hand with the Air Force's uh, roughly 400 aircraft. So <clears throat> Iran has absolutely the capability to, def to defend its airspace and uh, basically control the waters around its coast and also to obliterate uh, all the American bases in the Middle East with all their ballistic and cruise missile tech because they have a lot of missiles and many of them are very accurate now So, um, and long range. So Iran is a major power in the region. You know, they're not the most powerful. You know, Turkey's, Turkey's definitely a heavyweight champion. And, you know, I mean, as far as like having an enormous, you know, conventional force and uh, yeah, Egypt is, is a large player as well. And even Syria, even though they're depleted and, you know, pretty thinned out from the Syrian civil conflict, they've been rebuilding their armed forces and they still have substantial armored forces. So, and Saudi too. Saudi's uh, definitely a, a fairly strong military, even though they have some inept commanders that don't really know how to use their armored forces effectively. They're, they still have on paper a pretty formidable force overall. And, you know, like I said, there's a lot of like strong players in the region. And that's a very dangerous place to have a situation like this erupt because there's also a lot of narrow waterways that navies can get trapped in and a lot of uh, places that can easily be blocked off, like the Suez and the Straits of Hormuz and uh, the Gulf of Aden, you know, I mean, you know, like where China has their naval base at Djibouti. Um, China also essentially uses uh, Sri Lanka, like I told you all about a while ago, and I was right about it, of course, you know, where Sri Lanka was taken back by China because they owe China all this money. China had a bunch of their naval vessels show up in Sri Lanka and drop off assets and put in a Chinese-friendly regime because they owe China money, and Sri Lanka tried to defect to the West when they had their regime overthrowed and all that civil unrest, and their regime, you know, basically escaped. You know, and when China, China showed up and put a friendly regime in and uh, they have a 99 year lease on the port of Hambatota and they use that as a military supply base for their naval vessels uh, that's a fact their naval ships do go there and they get resupplied so uh, they also have Reem as a formal naval base in Cambodia so China has you know what they like to call a string of pearls in the Indian Ocean where they have Reem in Cambodia to Sri Lanka just south of India all the way to Djibouti on the other end of the Indian Ocean. So China uh, has the full capabilities of a any other blue water deploy around the world navy, and they're the biggest, most powerful navy and most technologically advanced navy in the world now. Um, you know, they 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 their technology is incredible on their vessels. You know, their their Dragon Eye technology, which you know is just like our Aegis. You know, it's in that it's in that category. It's in that weight class, and they have stealth ships now in the form of the Type O fifty five, and you know they're coming out with even more. More advanced ships and submarines too, and they have their uh, Type 093, 094, and 095 submarines. Very quiet, you know. They had one pop up in Japanese waters, and it wasn't detected until it surfaced. Uh, so I'm talking about the chi a Chinese sub. So. Um, China is very advanced technologically in their navy, even though propaganda likes to in the West likes to, to you know belittle our enemies. You know, it's it's just a fact. You know, China's the biggest drone producer, and they produce some of the most advanced drones, like their Wing Loon drones, which are their armed drones. Their WZ-7 high altitude 
spy and targeting drone, which is also a stealth drone. They're Shangji drones. They're they're Y8DZ. They're Y80s. Uh, they're electronic spying drones. You know, they have a lot of different drones, and they're all very uh, technologically advanced and capable drones. And they also have the world's biggest combat air fleet in, in terms of just total combat aircraft. I'm not talking about their full air force, you know, like including support aircraft. That's one thing that they're, you know, behind on, but they'll catch up and they'll catch up quick because China has an enormous aircraft industry. It's now bigger than ours. Um, China, not just in commercial aircraft, but in military aircraft, vastly outproduces us. Uh, so China will very soon surpass us in total air force numbers. But for now, uh, they have the world's biggest combat air fleet, but they have a smaller, uh, support aircraft fleet than we do, but they have the biggest combat air fleet, meaning number of combat aircraft, which means the number of planes they can deploy to fight. So they have a total of, uh, 2,852 combat aircraft. Um, and if you count their naval aircraft, you add 400 to that. So it's like 3,000 and, uh, what would it be? 3,252 if you added their 400 naval combat aircraft. So, um, yeah, they, they, they have enormous numbers of combat planes and they, they have a thousand more total combat aircraft than we do. And they have about 900 more than Russia. Russia is very close to what we have, but they have a little bit more than us because they have a very large bomber fleet, including the bombers they keep maintained in storage for later use for like reserve air crews, um, if they need them. And they also have a large helicopter fleet in reserve as well. Uh, a lot of like their old hind type aircraft that they keep maintained in storage as well. Um, and Russia is, you know, as a testament to how well that they've done in Ukraine, you know, besides demographically destroying the whole nation. I mean, and, and I'm not not saying that to joke. I'm just saying it literally. I mean, they, they've literally done that at this point. Um, a testament to how well they've performed in Ukraine is the fact that such a small force that they sent in was able to do so much damage and that was able to hold off all the Ukrainians to keep them busy while they did this enormous buildup of hundreds of thousands of additional troops, full complement of armor, artillery, helicopters, aircraft, the works, APCs, IFVs, you know, air, airborne troops, all of it combat engineers all waiting to be used to be greenlit to knock ukraine out of the park i mean they're they're just they're built up in a crescent around ukraine i mean from belarus southern belarus all the way to uh western russia in you know swooshing down into you know southeastern ukraine that is where they're they've been building up at and they haven't even been committed yet most of them some of them have to patch up parts of the lines where you know russia felt that it was necessary like if ukraine was trying to attack at that moment or something like that you know they, they would use some of the units to you know plug up gaps in the lines because remember 70 combat battalions really isn't that many troops so you know they, they've committed some of their forces to the line but not very many. I mean, you still have ultimately hundreds of thousands of troops that have been busy training and getting ready for their final mission, you know, which will be to finish off Ukraine. I mean, Ukraine is so weak right now. I mean, they hardly really have any of their original weapons remaining. I mean, most of what they have left is, you know, very small amounts of what they began the war with, because most of what they began the war with is either destroyed or captured or, you know, uh, basically damaged beyond all repair. And, you know, most of what they use now is Western weapons, where you have a lot of these Western mercs manning these weapon systems that the Ukrainians haven't been trained on or, or not or not capable of using. So, yeah, you still have a lot of Western mercs activity there and there were British mercs that were captured and just like I said in a video a long time ago Russia is going to treat them like uh, not like soldiers but like terrorists and they've already charged them in court in Luhansk and they're going to be going to a Russian prison these British mercs that were captured so you know a place like Black Dolphin 
is not a place I would want to go. You know, I mean, that's that's a nasty, vile, evil place to be locked up in. And a lot of these mercs that get captured are going to end up in these horrible Russian prisons, probably for life, because they're going to be treated as terrorists. So, you know, they're going to get the they're going to get the treatment. Um, so. Ukrainians, though, uh, the actual Ukrainian forces have been surrendering in droves in large numbers. I mean, there was an instance where uh, not that long ago, what was it, 10,000 surrendered at a time? That's like all, an entire division. <clears throat> if you're putting it in like a uh, uh, the frame of like a unit size, that's like an entire division surrendering at one time. That's a large amount of troops. That's, that's you know, nothing to sneeze at, really. I mean, that's that's quite a bit of troops, you know, just giving up at once. You know, that would that would jeopardize, you know, a lot of the line that they were holding, you know, just for all of them to just put their weapons down and surrender. I mean, you know, they've been giving up in droves for a while now. I mean, you know, it's incredible that, you know, Russia is you know, still waiting to do whatever they're going to do. I mean, they literally could could have ended this at any time if they wanted to. I mean, they have the full capability to lob many surface to surface missiles, strike all these air defense sites, knock them out, you know, fly huge sorties of uh, heavy strategic aircraft over the country, carpet munition it to dust and then send in their uh, close in air support and their, their ground attack aircraft and, you know, fighters armed with ground attack munitions hit, hit whatever air bases remain, communications and, you know, command centers and all that stuff and then roll in with their heavy units and just mop up. I mean, they could have done that at any time, really. I mean, Ukraine is like, I mean, seriously, I mean, they could have done that to Ukraine easily. I mean, they're playing with Ukraine like a cat plays with a mouse before it eats it. I mean, it's... It's almost agonizing to watch in a way. It's agonizing for all kinds of reasons, but it's agonizing. But I know what I know what they're doing and why they're doing it. They're doing it to grind down the the West as much as they're doing it to grind down their neighbor. I mean, they're doing it to grind down the West and its capabilities. And now when we enter this conflict in the Middle East, we're going to be severely diminished in artillery shells because we ourselves have very little left. I mean, even the European countries can't afford to give any more. Germany down to 20,000 shells remaining. I, mean, I shudder to wonder what we're down to. I know at one point we gave Ukraine 2 million shells between 155 and 105, and that was allegedly, you know, two thirds of our stocks, which is what made us go around the world pilfering for shells, like in North Africa and Middle Eastern countries asking for shells, you know, South Korea. I mean, we were pilfering for shells, and then we accused Russia of doing the same things. We were projecting onto them what we were doing ourselves, you know, a narrative. You know, that's what I'm talking about. And now, because we, we literally had plundered and a joint Israeli U.S. arms depot, which had these 155 shells to give to Ukraine, we plundered it. Israel is extremely low on artillery shells. And they demanded that we restock them. But So where are we going to get them from but ourselves? We have to get them from home. So that means that now we have to send roughly 500,000 of our shells out of our stocks here to them, leaving us with what, like 500,000 left? You know, so it's going to take us years to replace that, to get back up to where we once were at, at 3 million. It's going to take us a bunch of years at what, 90,000 shells a year. So it's going to, man, it's going to take us a long time to get back to, to, uh, you know, 3 million shells. It's going to take us some years. It's going to take us some years. So now that we're so depleted horribly, ground attack munitions, we gave, we're giving even more of the rocket artillery, we almost don't have any left. You know, we, we already gave, you know, Ukraine like half of all the rocket artillery we had, you know, which was over 12,000. Now we're giving them even more for their high Mars systems, you know. So what are we going to have left out of that? You know, how many are we giving? Are we giving a few more thousand? Are we giving three, four thousand? How many rocket artillery rockets are we going to have remaining for our M270 MLRS and high Mars systems? How many are going to be left? out of our once 25,000 stocks that we already gave half of and pledged to now give more of. So what are we going to do? I mean, we, it takes to produce 250. It takes one year to produce 250 of those. So 
In four years, you'll have a thousand of those rockets. In four years. I'm just talking about the regular rockets, not even the attackums, which are the cruise missile pods that you can put on there and fire a attackums cruise missile out of. You can put two on an MLRS and you can put one on a HIMARS. We've already pissed away some of those to Ukraine, you know, no telling how many. I mean, they shot they shot eighteen at one time at Russia and only one of them got through and hit and destroyed two helicopters. You know, that's that's a fact. You know, they they didn't they weren't all that capable. I mean they were intercepted. They were slow enough to be intercepted pretty well. Um, you know, it's just the fact that they shot so many at one time that, you know, of course one is going to get through, you know, one or two might get through, but one got through and, you know, it destroyed some helicopters. I mean, it was pretty, you know, ineffective overall. So, you know, I mean, it's just, you know, this conflict has shown the West a lot of things, all its vulnerabilities. I mean, how it would perform in a war. Like Colonel McGregor said, you know, we're, we're entering these conflicts with a World War II structure going against modernized armies that have modernized technology that can face us down. They have countermeasures to everything we have, folks. I mean, air defense weapon systems to fight our helicopters, uh, air defense systems to fight our jets, our fighters and bombers and ground attack planes. They have, uh, some of these nations have anti-ballistic missile capabilities. Even Iran has developed some to hit ballistic missiles. And, you know, like they can even, con even those that could carry nukes, you know, they can knock them out of the air. You know, like we, how we have the THAAD, you know, I mean, Iran has their own ABM. So does uh, China and Russia. China and Russia have a bunch, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's, you know, we're at a point where we're fighting these very powerful enemies that have these very powerful capabilities and countermeasures. They have ballistic missiles and cruise missiles that can sink our ships too, like our aircraft carriers. Now, our aircraft carriers are not safe. Like the Chinese who, despite all the denials from, you know, all kinds of propagandists, the Chinese have tested successfully their DF-21Ds and DF-26Bs on drone-piloted tankers in the Pacific. They've sunk them. A tanker is a little smaller than an aircraft carrier, usually. I mean, you know, if they can hit a tanker with, with its moving with accuracy, then they can damn sure hit an aircraft carrier. They can hit even smaller ships as well, like frigates and destroyers. I mean, because some of these uh, warheads have cluster munitions so they can hit all kinds of ships with them and destroy them uh especially when they're coming down above them on top of them so um yeah i mean we, we're totally we're totally uh outgunned in all these different areas of the world i mean we would have to be a damn fool to sail in with our legacy navy and expect to like really be able to defeat anybody in the state that we're in i mean sure we still have air and uh and sea-based munitions we can attack with like cruise missiles and uh you know airdrop munitions and uh air fired munitions you know if you're like firing an air to ground missile or if you're dropping you know uh gps or laser guided you know munitions you know you, you, sure we have that still but i mean we have a limited supply of that too i mean are we gonna like use all of that stuff on damascus and make it a heap of ruins and then you know run out of all that stuff i mean like are we gonna use it to fight the lebanese and the hezbollah and run out and waste our stuff I'm telling you, we lack the industry to replace this stuff. You know, you hear all these people talking about a draft, but they have no damn idea how the logistics of such a thing would work. They just don't understand. It's not really possible. I mean, anybody can say something. Anybody can say anything. You know, nominally, anything can be anything. But, you know, physically, re realistically, you know, can you back it up? You know, how would a draft work? I mean, because... Take, for example, you know, TRADOC, Army TRADOC, the training posts that turn out recruits, you know, for the units that replenish the units when, see, people come and go from the military all the time. You know, people are either finishing their contracts and not re-enlisting or, or they get discharged in some kind of way or they, you know, get medically retired like me. They get partial part-time retirement of 10 years or they get full-time retirement at 20 years. People are constantly coming and going from the armed forces. And that's why, you know, the TRADOC has 
has to replenish those people. And the Army Trade Dock can turn out between 100 and 105,000 on a good year every year or so annually. So they're just barely replacing the people that leave, you know. So, you know, how in the hell is a draft going to work when they did BRAC closures that closed all these installations, like from the Vietnam era, and then they turned them into other things, repurposed them, you know, for whatever, refugees or, <laughs> I mean, immigrants, whatever, you know, uh, illicit activities that this regime does. Who knows, you know. I mean, but they repurposed all these places, you know. They're not usable for, you know, any kind of, like, trade dock post if they added needed to add trade dock posts on a short notice for, you know, turning out re- re- con- conscripts and draftees, you know, as a recruit force, like to build up a large force in a short time, relatively speaking. You know, you're not going to be able to do that when you don't have the facilities to. The limitation right now is about 100, 105,000 for the Army. You know, what are you going to do? I mean, you can't put a tent city on these already, uh, you know, these limited bases. I mean, you already have these limited structures that can fit a limited amount of people. You're not going to be able to put 10 cities out in the training areas. Then where are you going to train everybody? You know, how are the logistics of that work? You know, you, it already takes so many, you know, thousands of tons to maintain these recruits and the, and the recruiting stations, whether it's, you know, you're talking about all the food required, the water and beverages, the, uh, you know, including MREs and bottled waters and things like that for the field exercises. You're talking about the training ammunition, whether it's blanks or live ammo or, uh, you know, all sorts of equipment and parts for the equipment and everything. It takes so much just to train people, whether it's training them on different equipment or weapons or, uh, you know, or, or having the facilities to house them. I mean, you know, where they're going to sleep and bathe and eat. And, you know, you have to take these things into consideration and the time it takes to train new recruits. I mean, you're not going to be able to have a real draft in this country. How would the transportation for such a thing work? I mean, what are they going to do? Are they going to conscript Greyhound to do it? Or are they going to pay Greyhound to go out to all these far flung, you know, areas of America and pick people up and take them to MEP? And you realize you're going to have to build a lot more MEP stations and military entrance and processing centers. You know, you're going to have to build a lot more of them and bigger ones. And you're going to have to hire all kinds of staff for them, you know, because you need civilian staff to maintain those places because that's where you process people in. You're going to have to build a lot more of them and expand the ones that already exist. You're going to have to have a transportation network to bring the people to MEPs, then bring them to their, uh, uh, you know, training stations, you know, whether it's, you know, whatever trade dock post. And you're going to have to build new trade dock posts. And expand, you know, ones that already exist. And it's going to cost enormous amounts of money, take enormous amounts of time, and you need the industry to do it. We've given away so many of our stocks to all these foreign nations and groups. You know, like, okay, America has produced roughly between 8 and 10 million uh, variations of the M16. And 1 million M4 carbines, okay? When you join the military, they don't let you bring your stuff from home. They, they demand standardization of, of arms, you know, for the calibers, you know, for, for supply reasons, you know, so everything's uniform and the supply network works. For, you know, if you have all these different calibers, it's you, it would be a nightmare to supply everybody. They're not going to let you bring your stuff from home. They demand standardization of arms and equipment. And our industry cannot afford that. Our industry is not capable of churning things out that quick, you know, to supply everybody because let me tell you, all the stuff that was already produced, you know, and the stocks that have been pissed away on all these foreign nations and groups, you know, we have given away enormous amounts of uh, our rifles to uh, that were produced to these foreign nations. Like when we armed the Afghan and Iraqi uh, army and police forces, you know, all the thousands of uh, rifles we've given them and that got left behind and, you know, in both nations and, you know, all the arms we gave to the different, ra- uh, uh, I'm sorry, the different factions we support in the Syrian civil war, um, all the arms we've given to Ukraine. I mean, you have to take all that into account. What's really left to arm new forces with? Really nothing. I mean, they're not going to let you bring your, your stuff from home. You ain't going to bring your shit from home, no matter how good a gear you've got or whatever. If they, if they, I'm, ta- I'm talking about if there was like a draft, a real draft, and, you know, people decided they were willing to go and, and, and be a part of it, you know, which nobody wants to because everybody knows this is just another, you know, bankster war between East and West. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's not going to happen. But, you know, even if it could happen, you know, it's, it's impossible because we don't have the industry. You know, you need more 
than one tank factory that can only churn out 80 tanks tops a year. You know, you need more than one tank factory, which we only have one in Lima, Ohio. I mean, America has only just over a dozen major arms producers, you know, like your Raytheon and your Boeing and your uh, Lockheed Martin and your Shell factory, your your ammunition plant, your uh, for, for small arms ammo and the Army, like, like the Lone Star, you know, Army ammunition plant in Texas. And, you know, you've got a handful like a like your tank plant in Lima, Ohio, and your your Bradley place in Pennsylvania. I mean, you've got like a handful of places that, that produce. You know, I'm talking large industrial sites that produce uh, armaments for the military industrial complex in America. And a lot of the a lot of the uh, uh, production lines for higher end weapons have been shut down for some time. And they have brought in people because we don't have the skilled labor. We don't have the munitions manufacturing specialists and the uh you know scientists and physicists like physicists and nuclear physicists and uh you know mathematicians and you know <laughs> engineers and uh you know uh welders and like all these high-end people you need for our mechanists machinists for all these high-end weapons productions you know, we don't turn out those types of professionals on a large scale anymore i mean we're bringing people out of retirement to try to research start production lines, go over the schematics so that they can teach that to a new generation and get these things restarted. And we have such a small industri military industrial complex as it is, and people don't even understand that. It's not that big. I mean, most of our uh, military production is outsourced to like medium to small scale type of facilities. I mean, we have very little large scale industrial plants for arms manufacturing remaining. Like I said, just over a dozen, like 14 or so. And then we have four military shipyards and all the rest of it's very small or medium scale at best. So China has over 600 massive military industrial factories and dozens more, dozens of medium to smaller scale type of plants because China has been on that building spree since they did their third front program between the 60s and 80s, and then they did another one between the 90s and now, where they, you know, quadrupled their military production capabilities by adding all these ginormous industrial plants, massive facilities, basically the size of the Lima, Ohio tank plant or larger or larger. China has a handful of tank factories. We only have one. I mean, just for example, China has a bunch of missile production plants. We like have one or two. I mean, China has many, many shell and ammunition production plants and many small arms production plants and many body armor production plants and many, you know, helmet production plants, many, you know, night vision production plants, IR and drones, you know, especially, you know, drones and artillery and tanks and stuff. China's enormous, man. You, you, nobody can compete with them. And when Russia's up there with them as like the second biggest overall military producer. Now, China might not be the biggest arms exporter, not yet, but like China's definitely the largest uh, domestic in, you know, the domestic user of their own arms. Like what I'm saying is that their forces are so enormous and so uh, they're so massive to equip that China not only keeps all their old stuff and upgrades, but they all this new stuff they produce, you know, they give to like the cream of the crop of their forces and then like the older upgraded stuff, which is still very deadly and capable, just gets pushed down to like, you know, second or third tier forces as like their first and second tier start, you know, getting the newest and best stuff, you know, they, the, you know, some of the second tier gets the stuff passed down to them and then they pass it down to third tier units you know i mean that's how it works in china and then they put other things in storage i mean they're they're massive and they they keep most of the weapons they produce because they're so enormous to equip and then you know they do export weapons they're the fifth biggest exporter of weapons but they use most of their domestic consumption of weapons i mean like they they now what i'm saying is the weapons they produce they mostly keep for themselves because they're their forces are enormous to equip. So they, I mean, it's obvious that they need to keep most of the weapons they make. So they have these enormous military industrial complexes. Russia has 300 large factories. Uh, China has over 600. Russia has over 300 large factories and a thousand smaller scale factories. And they, they're, they're hitting on all cylinders, outproducing the West in artillery shells by a factor of seven to one in artillery shells. And they, and overall, when you average out all their production, like vehicles and ammunition of all types and everything else, 
they outproduce the West by a factor of two to one when you average everything out. But in artillery shells specifically, in that one category, it's seven to one against the entire collective West. So while the West is depleted in armor, tanks, you know, and, and, and all kinds of vehicles, I, IFVs, infantry fighting vehicles, which are important on the battlefield, and, you know, engineering vehicles and uh, air defense and uh, all this stuff that the West has sent and gotten destroyed and you know, all these worthless uh, Ukrainian offensives that are just l massive loss of life on the Ukrainian side. You know, the Ukrainians have been at the point where they've been losing a thousand people a day, a thousand a day. That's a whole battalion every day. You know, I mean, it, it's gotten that bad, you know, where the casualty is the casualty rate is 20 to one favoring Russia because Russia has superiority in artillery, missiles, drones, air, air power, everything. I mean, it's not even right. I mean, it's not even like it's not even fair. I mean, Russia's destroying Ukraine and the West, you know, is probably glad to take the attention off of that because of how much of a failure it is. And uh, they're just, yeah, like like the people at the Duran said, they're just giving Ukraine money for life support at this point, uh, just to keep them going just a little longer while they, you know, start this other issue over here in uh, the Middle East, which is a death trap, too, for the West. I mean, this is going to get a lot of our pilots and sailors in a lot of trouble, and, you know, there's going to be a lot of loss of life, and including on land, because if Iran gets attacked, they're definitely going to hit our installations throughout the Middle East with all their missiles. I mean, they have... They have thousands of missiles i mean they've got roughly over ten thousand cruise and ballistic missiles so yeah and and they're pretty pretty good on artillery too as i've read you know they have uh 1900 rocket projecting artillery pieces with i'm sure a lot of rocket ammo and you know of course they've got a decent amount of howitzers they got roughly like 620 howitzers uh they have roughly 2000 tanks and 450 aircraft between their IRGC aerospace and their air, regular air force. So they, they've got 450 combat planes. So, I mean, they're, they're pretty well prepared and they have a lot of asymmetrical capabilities with all the different militant groups they control uh, throughout the region and elsewhere. So, you know, like I'm saying elsewhere is in like, you know, <laughs> nations they've infiltrated elsewhere with them. So Iran is a very dangerous foe, you know, I mean, not on the level of Russia or especially China, but they're very dangerous. Now, China being the world's superpower, they're just, you know, they're they're like nobody can take on China. I mean, they just can't. With the amount of, you know, raw air power China has, the massive size of their navy and capability of it, the, their air force capability, their massive, enormous army and reserves, their ready reserves of five million that finish their contracts and are in ready reserve status for 10 years go in these reserve group armies, all their 20 million different paramilitary branches, uh, their 20 million people in their paramilitary forces. Yeah, I mean, they're all combat grade paramilitary forces too, from their national militia, marine militia, PAP, which is like their paramilitary cream of the crop, like the Praetorian Guard of like the CCP regime, like the Waffen SS of China, and the, you know, the National Construction Corps, the PLA Strategic Reserves, not the Ready Reserve, the Strategic Reserve. I mean, there's a lot of paramilitary forces. I mean, they're enormous. Um, so, China, all in all, has 29 million underarms if they mobilized everything they've got. They got 29 million underarms and so many weapons and storage and active combined. I mean, it's 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 insane. Russia's big, but China's enormous. I mean, they have hypersonics. They have the uh, leader in directed energy and laser weapons. I mean, they're both Russia and China have phenomenal electronic warfare capabilities, very potent, you know, ISR capabilities where they can really, you know, see pretty much everything going on and relay it back for targeting data and, uh, you know, accuracy and, you know, basically surveilling the entire battle space and knowing everything that's going on. I mean, their cyber warfare is off the charts in China. Russia's pretty good at it too, but China has spent a lot of money on cyber capabilities. They hack solar winds. They've got all the nuclear secrets. I mean, it's been admitted that they've compromised our nuclear arsenal. Okay, so China did that. Um, yeah, and, and yeah, China's way ahead of us and Russia even too, and China's got anti-gravity craft and so does Russia. I mean, it's obvious China is a master in harnessing plasma energy. They have plasma reactors that they harness plasma energy from for, you know, for free power. And, you know, they have basically 
particle colliders. So if they've mastered those technologies and they have an anti-gravity craft, okay, they've got the crown jewels of the West a long time ago too. So it goes without saying that China is the main superpower in the world. While the West keeps and hides most of its technology underground in area, you know, whatever, 51, 52, 53, Studio 54, as I've joked before. I mean, we hide all our stuff underground. I mean, we, we, have, we just have all our high-tech stuff in an underground base somewhere that it's never mass-produced, never mass-deployed. We only have test pilots or test, you know, people, scientists. We don't, we don't, you know, we're too scared to basically bring our technology out into the open. So we hide it and never, it never gets used or employed. You know, I mean, we don't have like an AIT for like anti-gravity craft pilots. That doesn't exist. You know, <laughs> I mean, you know what I'm saying? So, I mean, it's like, you know, China can operate in secret. They mastered AI. They're the world leader in AI, which means that their security forces know everything that goes on in their country because AI monitors everything, monitors the phones and monitors the internet. They call it the great firewall of China that they can protect their internet with. I mean, they they have AI and cameras all over China. They, they spy on everybody with it. They would know if somebody was trying to leak secrets and they would send the MSS to cap them, which is like their combo of secret police and like intelligence agency all rolled into one. So uh, yeah, they their, their security forces would know what to do immediately and they would know who was doing what. And they monitor all their workers and all their, you know, high-end factories for their high-end weapons so that no one makes sure that everybody's a good patriot and not leaking secrets. I mean, and I'm sure Russia is, you know, much the same with their FSB keeping tabs on, you know, people that work at like state arms factories or things like that. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's obvious. And, you know, these countries have surpassed us. So when China says they're going to guarantee Iran's sovereignty, you know, I take that very seriously. You know, that's a very, very, you know, authoritative statement to make. Like they're asserting their authority over us, like saying that you're not going to mess with Iran, you know, because if you do, there's going to be consequences. And uh, yeah, they can definitely dish those out. They have their troops all over Canada, Mexico, inside our country, in, in Cuba, in the Panama Canal Zone, in Venezuela, and so does Russia, you know, I mean, and others. But I mean, they can definitely enforce their will upon us at any point in time. But I'm sure China would be happy to wait for us to have a civil conflict because they would like us to be so weak that we can't even lift a finger to defend ourselves, you know, because it costs them even less that way, you know, instead of us, you know, even if they if they invaded us now, they would still kick our ass, but we would be able to, you know, we'd be able to inflict some damage on them a little bit. And they don't want that. They want it so easy that they can just, you know, steamroll us and crush us and blast us into oblivion without us even being able to do so much as lift a finger. You see, they don't want an insurgency. They don't want to fight like a Vietnam type thing. I mean, you know, they, they will have to a little bit, but they don't want to fight a big one. They would rather all our capable people wipe each other out in a massive civil conflict instead of, you know, rising up like they did in my work, which which my work simulated a best case scenario for us. And it was still a horrible scenario, but it was a best case where, you know, we were able, where we didn't have a civil conflict, where we still had uh, capable people that could like form uh, resistance groups, uh, partisan elements against the chai comms and resist them. But, you know, in real life, there's going to be a civil conflict like the Bible says. You know, I, I did that on purpose the way I made that invasion work because I wanted to show a best case just to show people that, hey, even right now they could kick our ass. I mean, just literally by using the real units, the real equipment, real capabilities, simulating it as it was as it is right now before it collapse. I was showing that, yes, they can obliterate us right now. I mean, if they wanted to, but they would prefer that we don't have any type of resistance. They would prefer that we are as weak as possible so they can just waltz on in here and steamroll us and blast us and genocide us, whatever they plan on doing, you know, with, with impunity. Um, so, yeah, uh, back to what I was saying earlier. This all connects to a collapse, as in, like, the situation in the Midi and Ukraine, basically Ukraine wrapping up with Russia doing their master stroke with all those hundreds of thousands they built up, along with us failing in the Midi, along with us losing substantial amounts of pilots and aircraft and ships and ground forces that are in the Midi, you know, I mean, to a foolish attack against Iran or and or Syria um, and Israel being 
largely obliterated by Hezbollah rockets and uh, perhaps Syria, maybe Egypt. Egypt's a wild card in all this, but, you know, there would be a lot of places that would be not very satisfied with them making their move into the Gaza Strip. And, of course, there's 50,000 militants in Gaza that are ready to give them a hard time there and, you know, turn that place into like a mini Vietnam, an urban Vietnam of sorts with their tunnel networks and, you know, rubble and everything. Uh, or like a mini Stalingrad, I guess, Stalingrad-Vietnam hybrid type situation where all these thousands of uh, Israeli troops get bogged down and ambushed and, you know, basically ground down a little bit. And of course, in the north, you know, there's 150,000 rockets for all these rocket artillery systems and missiles. Uh, and all of them have different ranges and, you know, they could hit all different places in Israel, including their air bases and, you know, their runways and airports and air bases, anything that's on them out in the open, uh, not in a hardened shelter, um, cities and maybe their Dimona nuclear reactor and, you know, uh, all these other different sites, you know, bases, army bases, they've already destroyed to electronic warfare bases in northern Israel. So, yeah, they, they and they've been taking out tanks here and there, too, with anti-tank missiles. I mean, they, they're ready for a fight. I mean, and if Iran has brought systems there, like higher-end air defense systems and anti-ship systems into Lebanon and or Syria, um, then, yes, we will absolutely lose aircraft and carriers over the Mediterranean, too. I mean, you know, even to the stuff that Hezbollah already has, possibly, too, because they do have some anti-ship missiles that could reach out and touch us there. Um, they had some air defense, but it's not really like it's not the best air defense. They have air defense artillery cannons and things like that and some shoulder fired, you know, man portable air defense systems. But they don't really have like higher end air defense, which I'm sure would have to be provided by Syria and or, uh, you know, Iran especially, because Iran's got even better systems than Syria. Syria has some older systems, but and they're very thinned out from the civil war. But, um, you know, I'm sure Iran is probably moving stuff in there as we speak to get them ready. Uh, yeah, the, the Levant is going to be a ruined wasteland between the firepower that America drops in that area and Israel and the firepower that uh, Hezbollah, Syria and Iran and, uh, basically meet out in return and possibly Egypt and others. Who knows? But the Levant is going to be a cratered wasteland and Damascus just might get destroyed. Yeah, but all of that. All the losses between losing in Ukraine, all the all the immense amounts of resources and money and time and effort and ammunition and systems, weapon systems, vehicles, all the nine, uh, the whole nine yards that was dumped into that black hole for no return on it. That's going to lose at roughly the same time. I mean, it's pretty much already lost, but I'm saying at the same time, if Russia does their master stroke at the same time, we start losing ships and aircraft and ground forces and everything in the mid E, you know, that's going to be, that, that'll be such a shocking disaster. I mean, it'll send shockwaves through this nation. I mean, and morale wise, it would destroy the morale of seeing our military defeated so easily and losing Ukraine at the same time. I mean, it would just be a, a shock to people's senses. I mean, because people have been lied to about both Ukraine and, you know, our capabilities, you know, and to see us defeated in, in, basically two places at once, that would shock the senses of most Americans. It would slap some reality into them that, you know, this ain't the 1990s anymore or the early 2000s. No, this is 2023. You know, our enemies have uh, come a long way and we have declined a lot. And that's going to shock the senses of people to see that, you know, yeah, sure. You know, our Air Force and Navy uh, can inflict some damage, but I mean, you know, ultimately, you know, we can get our asses kicked, you know. Both sides lose things in war. I mean, even if your enemy has a decisive victory over you, you can still inflict some kind of damage on him. I mean, you know, that's not to say that we're not going to be able to, you know, pour down some munitions. It's just to say that we're going to lose a lot in this if it, if it gets into a full-blown regional conflict. You know, if it's not resolved by diplomatic means, then, yeah, we're going to lose uh, in this conflict. We're absolutely going to get our ass kicked. We're going to watch Ukraine be lost, and it's all going to happen roughly around the same time. It'll shock people's senses. Um, you know, it'll cause a ripple effect at home, and usually... 
When nations have bad overseas adventures, it causes unrest at home, and we're already seeing signs of collapse here anyways. It's been like in a state of slow collapse for the past several years. And to add to this to it, and oil sanctions from the Arab nations, and possibly the blockage of the Straits of Hormuz, and maybe even Suez... Having naval forces be trapped between, you know, the Red Sea and Mediterranean and the Gulf area. I mean, isolated, trapped, and destroyed because they're going to be caught in all these choke points. It's a death trap geographically. I can see all that very easily happening, or at least most of that exact scenario happening just like that. Like I've showed people uh, on the visuals and, you know, just like is starting to happen now with our installations being attacked by militants. There's the asymmetrical capabilities in action, uh, and that can only get an, uh, intensified because we're, we haven't seen anything yet. You know, these groups are pretty big that Iran funds and arms and trains and controls, um, and they're a serious danger to us, and so is the, all the missiles Iran has and weapons and air defense and uh, ballistic missiles and cruise missiles and, and their naval capabilities as far as hit and run, you know, uh, type forces uh so yeah i mean the type of attrition that can be inflicted on us by them is pretty horrendous if you really think about it or none of our bases are safe in the midi and uh none of our men are safe uh and syria could jump in too which still has substantial conventional forces at their disposal i mean they're not they're nowhere near as good as they were at the beginning of the civil war but they're starting to be rebuilt and they still have quite a substantial amount of armor um at their disposal so yeah, I mean, it's, and, and Egypt is a wild card, and so is Turkey, and so is Saudi. And the Saudi king might not lift a finger to help us, and he might even make it difficult for our forces to operate off his territory. And same with the Turks. Uh, and Egypt might close the Suez, and our naval forces, as a result, might get trapped in the Red Sea. Between They might get cut off between the Red Sea and the Med, Mediterranean, and the, uh, also the... Uh, the Gulf, Persian Gulf. I mean, it might, it might be a total catastrophe where Iran just has all these isolated vessels and groups of ships, carrier groups, strike groups, might have all of them cut off, isolated, and easier to pick off and destroy. And China and Russia lending Iran their ISR capabilities and electronic warfare capabilities would be an ultimate nightmare. China does absolutely have forces in Iran. A lot of people don't know that, but two years ago, there was a bilateral agreement with China where China was going to send 50,000 troops to Iran, and same with Russia. They did one with Russia, where Russia sent Air Force assets to Iran and technical experts, uh, as did China, too, really. I mean, China also had industrial projects as far as, like, oil and gas drilling in Iran, too, um, as part of that. And Iran, in return, got Chinese technology. And, you know, Russia did something for Iran as well, I think, something kind of military cooperation. Uh, anyways, um, yeah, I covered that two years ago. Um, it's not fresh in my memory, but I think that's what exactly it was, if I remember correctly. But, yes... All of this oil being cut off, we have 372 million barrels of oil left in our strategic reserve. We have been hovering around that exact amount for the last two years. When I covered how low our strategic reserve was two years ago, it stayed around that amount because they've been trying to steady, you know, keep, you know, refilling it whenever they could. And it stayed steady around that amount because they would pull from it and then refill it, pull from it. They've tried to keep it at, at, at this amount. And now at 372 million barrels, that's only enough for 20 days. And they, they've kept it at that amount. And if there's a war and we are cut off from oil, we have 20 days worth of oil. 20 days in that strategic reserve and the military would get priority to use it you know so being the military is a fuel hungry machine especially the air force that uses the vast majority of the oil consumption the air force uh i believe it was uh what two billion barrels of oil a year two billion you know so or two and a half billion. It was something in there. They used a lot more than the other branches. Uh, it was it was substantial. It was huge, and that was annually. That wasn't a you know a month or days. It was in a year, but it was a lot. It was it was like uh, two billion or more barrels, like two and a half billion. It was a lot of fuel. So, if we're cut off from foreign oil and all our domestic oil, which is half of our oil consumption, which we produce, you know, 
that's suddenly being cut off from half your oil and only having, you know, 372 million barrels in your strategic reserve, which is only 20 days. All of that's going to the military. So they would have to fight a very short war and hope to God somehow, some way that we could somehow just recoup that fuel from some some way somehow you know somebody would you know say oh well we feel bad for you america we'll 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 sell you some fuel you know we'll try and you know uh make some money off your misery and you know make up for half your consumption since all these other countries cut you off no that's not going to happen so what would happen instead is that it would be just like in my documentary where it starts off with the resources being at a bare minimum amount. Uh, all these different factions emerged after a Syrian-style day of rage type thing with massive civil unrest throughout the country because America's bubble would be popped. Everybody's comfy bubbles they live in would be popped. Everybody would be forced to get off the ride. Disney World would come to an end. and reality, a third world hellhole, fa- failed state would kick in. Everyone would realize that they now live in a failed state. Resources would be at a bare minimum ideologies would become even more toxic and, and and profuse you know you would have all the same types of ideologies coming out that i had in my documentary they might have different names but it would be the same types of ideologies you'd have ultra nationalists uh diverging from like conservative type people you'd have regular conservatives still but they wouldn't be like republicans but you would have regular conservative type minded people you would have ultra nationalists which would be like extremist conservatives like the nsrf was who became secular humanist and wanted to worship America, rebuild America into their image and worship it as a god unto itself. So they were secular humanists. They believed in the almighty state, as in the almighty regime, the almighty nation. They, they believed in the state. They wanted to rebuild it in their image as an ultra-nationalist nation because they hated globalists, which was the regime. They hated the regime, but they hated everybody else too. They hated the Mormon state. They hated all the moderate type people that were like libertarians that wanted local rule. You know, they like like the Union of Southwest Militias basically was a confederation of all the communities in, in their area, like in Nevada and Arizona. It was all the different communities that all were locally governed, which made them more free because people could, you know, choose their own town leaders and everything. But they all came together and contributed forces for an army, the Union of Southwest Militias. That's why it was called that, because every town contributed forces to the militias. It was a union. It was a libertarian type environment where you were it was very humane because the people there were freedom minded they didn't abuse their pow's they were very humane because they were all freedom oriented people they wanted to you know treat people the way they wanted to be treated so they weren't extremists like the mormon state who would behead them if they didn't convert to mormonism or uh like the nsrf that would hang all their enemies and then you know later they would you know they they would either hang or machine gun them or burn the worst of them on a stake and later they moved all that stuff into the prisons and they would you know starve them to death in starvation cells until their stomachs, you know, came bloated and burst open. And it, 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 yeah, it was the atrocities were extreme committed by some of the factions, but other factions like Texas and the Union of Southwest Militias and the Free American Army, they were more humane in Florida and uh, the, the uh, southeastern uh, so, I'm sorry, yeah, the Southeastern Army, Army of the Southeast, they were all pretty humane. I mean, they, they weren't abusive towards their POWs, I mean, because they were all freedom-oriented type groups, but they all wanted different types of things. Like, Texas and Florida wanted to be their own nations um, because Texas had already been a nation once, and Texas sought to, you know, become independent, be a nation again, and Florida decided it wanted to be a nation, and the uh, Southeast uh, Army wanted to, you know, eventually join Florida, but they had to liberate all their other terror areas Areas of territory that they controlled, you know, they wanted to, you know, break the regime uh, hold on some of it and the Free American Army hold on the other parts of it uh, because the regime and Free American Army were fighting with them. The Free American Army wanted, or the, yeah, the uh, Free American Army was the one fighting to put America, the, all of America, back under the Constitution, but it was too little too late because their coup had failed. Because had their coup succeeded, they might have had some ground to stand on, but by the time they did their coup, all the other factions came out of the woodwork at the same time. All wanting their own things. So the NSRF wanted to fight the uh, 
regime, of course, uh, but also the Free American Army over power over the whole country. The Mormon state wanted the same, but they were so far out west that, you know, first they had to deal with their local enemies, like including the regime on the west coast, but also the Free American Army they fought and the Union of Southwest Militias. And definitely they really hated the... Uh, uh, what was it, the uh, La Raza Narco State, which was another evil faction, a very extreme one. They took territory, uh, they came up from Mexico, and there were a band of criminals and narco militants, and they took control over territory in New Mexico, and they, uh, them and the Mormon State had it out, and the Mormon State put a holy war on them because they hated drugs, and they wanted to destroy their drug labs and everything, and uh, and hit them where it hurt in their, in their uh, money maker, you know, so they tried to hit their labs and their uh, and they also sold weapons, so they wanted to hit their weapons depots as well because they used and sold the weapons that they imported from uh, third-party brokers because China and Russia sought to destabilize us the way we tried to destabilize Syria by arming some of the factions. Russia did the same thing, and China did the same thing in, our, uh, in my documentary of our civil conflict. So that would be a real thing, too. You would have foreign uh, influence trying to destabilize things. Like you would have Russia and China selling very cheap, like dime a dozen type weapons, like grenades and mortars and RPGs and uh, air, uh, air defense artillery cannons and, you know, cheap rocket systems that are like a dime a dozen. I mean, the, the things they had laying around that they had way too many of and they didn't need, you know, they, they sold them to like Venezuela or Mexico, who in turn turned around and sold them to La Raza, who sold some of theirs to the uh, the real, like, hardcore secular humanist, uh, the NSRF, National Salvation Revolutionary Front. They sold some to them before the Mormon state took all the territory in between them and the uh, La Raza, so they didn't have the land bridge connecting their uh, territory anymore, um, because they were sending trucks full of weapons up there to sell to uh, the NSRF, who had got... Uh, people to donate, you know, jewelry and gold and uh, valuables they had to turn around and give it to the uh, La Raza for weapons. Uh, and they used those weapons to arm their elite paramilitary forces, their most fanatical ultranationalists that were part of the uh, Jolly Roger Death Brigades, which was like a separate unit from the rest of the NSRF's regular military forces, which consisted of their core forces, which is about a million strong of like veterans that were combat veterans and also uh, their defecting military units that decided to join them, like mostly National Guard and Reserve units in the area that joined up with them. And uh, of course, you know, uh, units made of like veterans, like combat vets that formed up with the uh, amalgamated together with the old units of the uh, defected regime forces in that area. And then of course you had the regular forces of just all these different ultranationalist militias that were like the, you know, main forces, like the most of them that, that basically were like filler units everywhere. <laughs> they were like just low quality but they were they were big in number like there was 3.8 million of them and then the 200,000 of the Jolly Roger death brigades were like the most fanatical ultra nationalist forces they often used them as breakthrough forces because they would charge into the enemies and try and break their lines and exploit their gains by you know everyone else pouring through the gap but uh yeah it was it was a brutal civil conflict and you know the Mormon state was also very brutal as well and the most vicious battle in the whole thing was uh, the battle fought over the nukes in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Now, you have to understand, another realistic aspect of a, of a multi-faction civil conflict in this country would be different factions fighting over the WMDs in this country. Not just the regular arms depots, like where all the tanks are and the, you know, munitions are stored, but I'm talking about like, you know, like like for like reserve units and all that stuff. And I, I'm talking about actual like depots, like where they keep like chemical weapons and uh, nukes and things like that. That's why Cheyenne was such a big battle, because you had the two most fanatical factions on the entire map, like one like extremely secular humanist and ultra nationalist and like evil and the other one evil as well, but it was a diabolical kooky, religious, theocratic cult type of evil, and they both clashed over the nukes at Cheyenne, and it was like a uh, immovable object meets an unstoppable force type of thing, like both kept throwing troops at each other, but they couldn't seem to break each other, and they finally had to come to a truce because it just got too, too brutal to where they agreed to finish their battle at a later time, and they had a very, uh, very fragile peace where they agreed to... Um, 
cede control of the installation itself over to the Mormon state since the NSRF was able to get some of the nukes already out and back to Lincoln, which was their capital in the scenario, um, by train. And the trains were running for a little while at the beginning of the civil conflict because there was enough fuel for the trains for a little while. But later on in the conflict, it got down to where they were like getting to the bare bones of the fuel in the nation because the fuel depots were getting lower and lower because there was a very limited amount of fuel that all the factions had to begin with because uh, there was a certain amount of fuel left in the country and each faction got a certain amount and they had to budget it very carefully and uh, very little was produced by the major fuel producing factions like Texas and the Free American Army and their Louisiana areas and you know where they had fuel uh, refineries and uh, oil derricks and also the uh, uh, NSRF and the Mormon state really had major fuel issues so they used a lot of animal transport and then eventually the other factions did as well because the trains eventually didn't have enough fuel and then they you know had to budget their fuel very carefully for the military vehicles and like use it specifically during battles of maneuver and they had to afterward they used animals to carry the fuel uh, drums into battle because they had to really be careful with their vehicles you know they couldn't use too much fuel for the vehicles they had to save that for battles uh, it got really crazy toward the end of it but at the very beginning the trains were running for a little while they could transport units certain factions could they could transport units and logistics with trains but then got down to using trucks and then it got down to using animal transport because as fuel got lower and lower by all the factions uh, certain factions had the luxury of continuing to use fuel a little longer than the others but eventually everybody got down to using animal transport for logistics and then it forces began to move at a snail's pace because they could only move as far as their logistics could move you know as fast and as far as their logistics could move and take them so you have to take all that into consideration in a brutal multi-faction civil conflict like in Syria, we will absolutely have something like that here before we get invaded. It's also biblical. Conflict or violence will erupt between various leaders, plural. That is in Jeremiah, uh, before we get invaded in 50 and 51. Various leaders, meaning, meaning armed faction leaders, conflict or violence, depending on your translation of your Bible, will erupt between various leaders, plural. Many leaders, faction leaders, armed groups. So that, you know, that, that, that is saying that we're going to have a Syrian-style civil conflict before we are invaded by China and Russia and their little allies that are part of their coalition. So, yeah. Basically, I wanted to let people know that all of this stuff is leading into all my work coming to pass. You know, I mean, much of it already has in the sense of the civil conflict docuseries. I mean, woke, I, I predicted woke militias before they became a real thing on the scene, before they stepped on the scene with standardized gear and weapons and everything. Like when they showed up to that Texas event here, that certain event, and they had standardized equipment and unit patches and everything. And I predicted that before that even happened. I mean, I just did such good research when when I combined all these different social aspects and uh, ideological aspects and um, looking at the trends and where they were going type of aspects and uh, combining the real units because I did use real units and uh, realistic types of units would absolutely be real like the you know types of uh, specialized units that would be created like the different militias or religious militias like in the case of the Mormon state or the paramilitary group in the case of the NSRF and like their Jolly Roger death brigades there would absolutely be units like that being made by these uh, different factions I mean when you have crazy faction leaders with their own designs on power and everything they're going to be creating all types of fighting forces to achieve that like the brigham young brigade the first force of the mormon state the first group of fighters from all the compounds that came together to take over the mainstream mormon church and their church coup and their state coup where they took over the, the whole mormon church and the state of utah in one fell swoop and then they expanded um that exact type of thing could really happen i mean seriously i mean it, the way it played out, yeah, that those types of things are absolutely possible. I mean, they're 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 beyond possible. I mean, they're they're highly realistic. I mean, you could see these different types of extreme elements come out and seize control of regions, localities, or you know, even like you know, whole states in some cases. I mean, 
like Texas becoming its own nation. I mean, that's very plausible. You see Texas already making moves towards, you know, having a separate, they already have a separate power grid of their own. They already have their own uh, gold depository, repository, whatever you want to call it. Uh, they have, you know, with, with quite a bit of gold in it already. I mean, they have their own um, ships as part of like the Naval Reserve out at Beaumont, but they could become part of the Texas uh, uh, ships as far as like if Texas seceded, they would have those tankers, they would have those cargo ships. Those are reserve ships, you know, for like the the Navy, you know, carry fuel and supplies. Um, they could very well take those ships under state control in a situation like that. I mean, they have the capability to do all kinds of things. They have their own oil refineries. The Strategic Reserve, you know, is here. I mean, it's, it's you know, we, have our, we produce our own oil. I mean, it's an advantageous place if it's seceded. Um, it's got a pretty sizable National Guard that would become its National Army if it's seceded. Uh, it's got a State Guard, which is technically unarmed, but it could arm a I mean, it answers only to the governor only. And I mean, it's got it's got a lot of things within it that would, uh, you know, make it possible, make it easy for it to become its own nation if it wanted to, which is why I mentioned a lot of those things in the civil conflict docuseries. I mean, I put every realistic component in that I could even think of. I mean, from everything from the units, the way the battles were fought, uh, the equipment, the everything in it, the way the militias rose up, the way the different aspects of it uh, occurred and the mechanics of it, all the defined details in it. I mean, really and truly, I mean, every bit of that was extremely realistic. I mean, just to show people how these things work. Now, all the work on my channel is what you would call applied sciences as far as like you take the work itself and apply it to your own life as far as your emergency planning and how you would plan for similar or same exact type of scenarios that develop along those same or similar lines um so like in the sense of uh you know like an invasion you know do you have a way to quickly evacuate away from human settlements, meaning towns or cities, to get out into nature, preferably the woods where you have some cover away from infrared technology like uh, coniferous pines or just thick forest canopy in general to disguise you, a place where you can dig underground and store uh, caches of supplies, be it medical and food and water. Without supplies, you're not going to make it very long. You know, you will be forced out of your home. Nobody is going to... Uh, stay where they began at i'll just put it that way wherever you live or stay at nobody is going to stay wherever they began at you will be forced out of your home or wherever you're at you will be forced into nomadism that is the only way you're going to make it otherwise you will fall prey to being uh, a slave a prisoner of the chai comms or their allies or you will be eliminated uh, and the only way to make it is by being a nomad and constantly moving around place to place. Do you have supply caches you can move between because you need supplies to sustain you? You're not going to immediately go out there with nothing and automatically be able to survive out there. You're going to get very tired. You're going to get weak. You're going to burn a lot of calories. You're going to need food immediately. You know, you would be, it would be a blessing if you could succeed all the time in hunting and fishing, but not everybody's going to be successful in that all the time, you know, and you have to have other ways to supplement your diet with uh, vegetation and things like that so in the meantime what are you going to do you need supplies without supplies and logistics you are going to perish you need supply caches distributed throughout nature in your area and you're never going to operate very far from your supplies like including even like something like ammunition if you go out there and you can only carry the ammunition gets heavy you can only carry a certain amount of it you know a certain amount of magazines or whatever you can only carry a certain amount of it loose loose ones or magazines and by loose ones i mean if you're using something like a lever gun or whatever I, whatever you know you can only carry a certain amount of ammunition it gets heavy so when you run out of ammunition which you <laughs> most assuredly will uh, you're going to need to go back and re-up on it. So you better have a way, you know, to get back fairly quickly or to get to another supply cache that's close by because you're not going to operate very far from it. If you go out like 10 miles from your nearest supply cache and you get into an altercation and you expend all your rounds, you know, and you're out, well, what if enemy forces come in between you and your supply cache that you, your nearest one that you left? What are you going to do? 
What are you going to do? You're out of ammo. What are you going to do? <laughs> You're SOL. You're shit out of luck. So you better have a plan. You better have a way to rotate. You better have a way to, uh, you know, hide your supply caches, bury them, hide them somewhere where only you know where they're at out in nature. Like I always tell people, um, at least have one or two at the bare minimum, bare minimum, you know, don't keep all your stuff in one location. Cause if it gets overrun or destroyed, then you're shit out of luck. Uh, watch my community tab story reviews it starts very basic very simple but it's like building blocks it works its way up it gets a little more complex as the subjects you know get a little more complex it starts very simple and basic it starts with organization and then you work your way up from there like building blocks it starts simple I mean I know it sounds simple at the beginning couple videos but but you know pay attention and watch them all It'll get more and more complicated as far as the subject matter as it goes on. Um, it'll teach you a lot about survival, even field sanitation, which is critical. It's of dire importance. If you're going to be living out in nature, you need to understand the necessities of field sanitation. You don't want to get dysentery, cholera, or typhus, or any of that. That stuff will kill you, especially if you don't have any way to treat it. You know, no proper medications out there, you know, no medical treatment that's proper. You will die from those things. You need to understand how important field sanitation is if you're going to be living out there in the field. You know, I had to do it in Iraq. You know, you're going to have to do it when you're out in nature. You know, I mean, and you're going to have to learn how tactics work, small unit tactics. You don't know those. You're going to get wiped out because your enemies are going to sure use them against you and they're going to grease you because you're not going to, you know, if you don't study that type of stuff, you're not going to know what hit, what hits you. You're just going to be ambushed from and outflanked, outmaneuvered. You're going to be killed. I hate to put it that way, but, you know, that's what it is. You know, you have to learn how those things work. And maybe if you have a small group, you can pick up on that yourself, if you know what I'm saying. So, um, in that, I have building and outdoor tactics, small unit. So building assault tactics and small unit uh, outdoor tactics, you know, like showing how enemy units would operate, you know, professionally as groups. Uh, some of the uh, tactics would be a little advanced, like the closing L formation and things like that. But, you know, that's all stuff that's important to know how it works, you know, because that way you can sort of plan around it. Listen to the audio book. It talks a lot about how those things are implemented in real life situations, you know, in the audio book and uh, watch civil conflict docuseries see how the factions all developed and moved and how everything worked you know uh and understand how that would affect you depending on what type of area you end up in and what type of faction seems to hold the most control and sway over your respective area learn how to adapt around that you know hopefully you live in a neutral area that chooses not to be involved and and stays in a defensive posture um but yeah uh so you know pay attention to all the work it's it's a critical importance now more than ever because uh it's getting very close to collapse and uh calamity and you know that's going to lead into the multi-way civil conflict and then after that we will be invaded because china will be able to roll in here without much resistance because all our best people will have uh wiped each other out and they won't have to worry about a giant you know partisan uprising they can just walk in and immediately exploit the resources and strip mine everything and enslave the people that are left you know so you know, pay attention to all my work. It's of dire importance more than ever. Um, so y'all be blessed. You know, I hope this was a good video for everybody. Taught people a lot. Take care.